All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we're going to try and finish up our chapter on, on uh, alcohols today. And if we have time, get into talking about ethers. Um, and, you know, we're going to see a lot of really similar um, mechanisms to what we've seen in the past with a couple of, of adjustments, especially when it comes to substitution. Um, but we'll start with uh, quiz questions. Um, let's see, we'll start with, um, who's here? We'll start at the top. Um, so what solution could they have used to freeze the ice faster for the NHL games in town the last week? If you guys weren't uh, watching, um, we had uh, two NHL games outdoors at Edgewood on uh, Saturday and Sunday. And on the first one on Saturday was supposed to be from noon to noon to three or so. Um, and uh, they, they were not prepared for the amount of sunlight we get up here. Um, and basically it being what mid forties or so and um, in direct sunlight at that time of day meant that the ice just melted way too fast for them to actually play a hockey game on. Um, and essentially what they what they weren't used to, what they weren't prepared for was our altitude. We get a, a lot more sunlight, about 25% about more sunlight um, at our altitude because we have less atmosphere to scatter the light. Um, and if you, if you were watching, you might, may have noticed that most of the melting was happening where they had put dark colored paint underneath the ice for the ads. Um, and so that's where you had the most melting happening because it was absorbing the sunlight the fastest. So basically the, the only solution they really could have, um, they really could have done to fix that would have been to put it in the shade, which kind of defeats the purpose of having an outdoor game at Lake Tahoe. Um, if they could have built a giant shade structure, then that would have helped and they could have done it at, uh, um, during the daytime. The, for the second game, they just wound up doing it at night. They had it, the puck dropped at like 4 or 45 or 5 o'clock at night, which was, you know, late enough that they were able to keep it all cool, but early enough that they could get some good, you know, beauty shots of Lake Tahoe. Um, but, and that's, I think that that's the number one thing people don't expect about coming up to altitude. Everybody thinks about not, or about um, being able to, um, breathe. And, and that is true that that is really hard. Um, and, you know, your boiling point elevation changes, but people forget that the sunlight is more intense as well. Um, when I was at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, which is a thousand feet lower than we are, um, you used to be able to, it was a big enough campus that if you walked around across campus in the summer, you could get a sunburn just walking across campus. It only took about 10 minutes. Um, to get a, a sunburn, just like up here, it only takes about 10 minutes of in the sunlight up here to get a, a pretty solid sunburn um, if you don't have um, your sunscreen on. We'll skip arsenic for a second. Um, a good question, a couple questions about oxidation states versus formal charge. Uh, and I think the best way to think about oxidation state versus formal charge is formal charge is the actual charge on an atom. So formal charge comes down to, we treat all of our covalent bonds as, as half the number of electrons, and then you compare it to the periodic table. And so that's how you get an oxygen with one bond has a negative one charge, and a carbon with, with four bonds is neut excuse me, neutral. Um, an oxidation state is more about being able to judge how stable something is, how high energy it is versus low energy. Things that are more reduced, because we live in an oxygen-rich environment, um, things that are more reduced are less stable. They're more high energy. And things that are more oxidized are more stable. So that's what we're looking at with oxidation state is it's a good way of 
of estimating how stable a compound is, how reactive it will be when it's exposed to an oxidizing agent. Um, the more oxidized something is, the less reactive it's going to be. Um, and it, it's, it always is gonna come down to what are the bonds around the specific atom for both of these cases, right? For oxidation state and formal charge. We'll keep practicing with that, um, but it does take a little bit of practice and it's kind of difficult to articulate exactly what the difference is, but it's formal charge is the actual charge. An oxidation state, you can think of it as being a measure of how stable something is. Um, what makes sugar alcohols useful is sugar substitutes, but not antibacterial agents. Since we've talked about both of these issues in, um, in this class so far, mostly the dose. Um, anything is poisonous at high enough concentrations, right? It's, you know, glucose is poisonous to bacteria at high, high enough concentrations. That's why you can, um, you can make preserves by just adding a whole bunch of sugar to fruit, right? And it goes from being something that yeast can digest and eat to being something that's preserved just by virtue of having so much sugar that the yeast itself can't even, can't even survive. Um, and so there's a lot of different reasons for that. Mostly it has to do with the osmotic pressure. Um, if you've got too much sugar, then you wind up with that, with that solution drawing moisture out of cells. And you can actually wind up desiccating the cells and then wind up with them dehydrating and dying when they try to grow on, um, on things that have too much sugar in them. Um, so, and this goes to the other question about uh, arsenic. And I think I mentioned I was reading Poisoner's Handbook um, is a, um, I do, I finished it this last weekend. I do highly recommend it. Um, and it actually does make use of what one of the key ideas of both bi of biochemistry and modern medicine is the poison is in the dose. Anything is poisonous if you have too much of it. Um, some things are more poisonous than others. Some things are poisonous at very low doses, but anything is poisonous eventually. Um, and so arsenic, um, I will talk about that basically. You can, you know, they used to, Back back in the day when when there were fewer rules and it was um, and chemistry was like the wild west, um, they used to do taste tests of compounds um, when they thought that they had isolated some new element or some new compound. They would literally taste a tiny bit of it and write down what it tasted like, and they did that with arsenic and it didn't kill them um, because you have to get above a certain amount. It made them sick a little bit, um, but it. What arsenic does biochemically makes that possible. What arsenic does is it basically replaces phosphorus in ATP. So in ATP, it's adenosine triphosphate, right? Everybody knows that that's referred to as the energy currency for the cell. Um, what arsenic does is it, it actually replaces the phosphorus in one of those phosphates and turns it from phosphate to arsenate. And arsenate makes a stronger bond with the rest of the molecule so that you can't break it off as easily. So this is a case where a strong bond is actually less favorable because all of a sudden you can't break your ATP up into ADP and energy because you've got arsenate there instead of the third phosphate. And so it's stuck there. And so you basically have ATP. It costs the cell as much energy to make as regular ATP, but you can't use it for anything. It's like it's like um, taking all the money out of your checking account and putting it into Bitcoin. I mean, yes, technically the the money's still there, but you can't spend it on anything, right? So, and so if you do that enough, you actually just wind up with your cells starving for energy, and they can't do anything, and they wind up dying. But if you're exposed to low levels of arsenic over long periods of time, you can cause prolonged weakness and it can cause a lot of, of health concerns, but it won't necessarily kill you because your body can flush that, that ruined ATP out um, over, over enough time. And so um, I, uh, 
So the book does not go, Boys in His Handbook does not go into that kind of detail about the mechanism for a lot of these. It talks more about symptoms. So those of you who are into the more um, the more medicinal field might really enjoy it. Um, I, I also feel it's worth noting that the very first medical examiner in the United States was for New York City, and his name his name was Charles Norris. And one can only assume that with a name like Charles Norris, you would abbreviate it and go by Chuck. So you know Chuck Norris just keeps showing up all over the place. <laughs> Um, I found that very funny. I changed that in personal headcanon. Chuck Norris was a medical examiner before he was Walker, Texas Ranger. Um, last but not least, the random questions. Why is serotonin so common? Um, it does seem to, even in single-celled organisms, serotonin-like molecules wind up being present. Um, mostly because it's it's very closely related to common amino acid tryptophan is a, is it not a very common in terms of use but it's ubiquitous in terms of all um, life on earth uses makes their proteins with more or less the same 20 amino acids tryptophan all you have to do is take tryptam is take um if you take tryptophan and you remove the or the acid part of it you get tryptamine which then if you add an OH group in the right place becomes serotonin. So a lot of these compounds that are, that are neurotransmitters for larger animals are still present in, in single celled organisms basically because they're really easy to derive from, from amino acids which are present in large amounts in, in pretty much all life. Um, same thing with dopamine. Dopamine is only two steps away from phenylalanine. Um, so you wind up with, with a lot of those messenger molecules or what they call amino acid derivatives. All right, the quiz as a whole, you guys did really well on, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it since I think the biggest question was on the, the only thing that everybody got marked down on was mostly the nomenclature part. Um, a few of you forgot to write S to, to assign the stereochemistry. And those of you guys who did, you should, most of you managed to put an extra space in the wrong spot or you know add a hyphen where I didn't put a hyphen in there. So everybody got marked down on that one. I think one out of the 10 of you put it in exactly the right way that the autocorrect graded it properly. Um, but I think everybody got close to full credit on that one. So um, good work on the quiz. So we ended talking about Grignard reagents the other day. And these Grignard reagents had one really, really critical aspect that kind of allows us to follow along the mechanism pretty easily. What is the key aspect of a Grignard reagent? While you think about it, I'll give some historical context. I did look up Grignard the other day. It turns out he is not Italian. He is, in fact, French or was French. Um, but right on, the, right on the line there between Italian and French with that GN as an NA. So Grignard was one who realized that you can actually get a polar covalent bond between carbon and magnesium. If you take a um, alkyl bromide or a phenyl bromide and you expose it to magnesium metal, you wind up with the magnesium basically sandwiching itself in between the carbon and the bromine and you get a carbon magnesium bond. And that carb carbon magnesium bond is, um, it's, a covalent bond is relatively strong, but it's also relatively polar. Carbon is more electronegative than the magnesium, so you wind up with partial negative on the carbon, which means it can be attracted to a partial positive on a carbonyl. So our mechanism is something like you start from your um, Grignard reagent, 
Um, so this whole thing is called a Grignard reaction, but the reactant, when you have the carbon with the covalent bond of magnesium, is called a Grignard reagent. And so your, your mechanism just looks like your Grignard reagent with the, with the carbon-magnesium bond breaking and attacking a carbonyl carbon. And then you have to remember to make room for the new sigma bond that you're forming. So that's step one for these Grignard reagents. It's also step one for our reduction reactions that use lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. Same step for both of these. It's just what is your nucleophile is different. So then we wind up with an intermediate that looks like We added our methyl group on there. We now have our oxygen, which has a formal charge that is negative. Because remember, it brought those electrons with it when our Grignard reagent attacked. So our oxygen only has one bond, but still has eight electrons. So it's got a negative one charge. So step two, we're almost to our to our target compound, right? Step two is just proton transfer. If you've got water around, it's a proton source. Quick proton transfer step. And we find ourselves with our product, All right? So these carbonyl reactions, there's nothing inherently tricky about them. The trickiest thing about them is, is sometimes we, they have different nucleophiles than what we've been used to. And we wind up with that partial positive being attacked, but we don't wind up with a full on leaving group. It's a little bit like a substitution reaction, right? In fact, it's a lot like a substitution reaction, but instead of um, your leaving group leaving in the substitution reaction, we just wind up with a pi bond breaking. So this is considered nucleophilic addition. Our first addition reactions we did when we first started talking about alkenes, those were electrophilic addition because the pi bond was attacked by something with a positive charge. So we had an electrophile attacking our pi bond. Here is a nucleophilic addition because we have something with a negative charge attacking a partial positive. Um, and if we have a cyclic ester, Esters can also be attacked by these um, Grignard reagents. We're just gonna have to do it in two steps. We're changing the oxidation state twice of the carbon. Here we went from carbon that had, let's, as long as we were talking about oxidation states, we went with two carbon oxygen bonds, only one carbon oxygen bond in the top, right? So that would be a, for the carbon, the oxidation state is going to go from so carbon carbon bond is no change, carbon carbon bond is no change, two carbon oxygen bonds. Each carbon oxygen bond is a negative, is a plus one to the oxidation state, right? Because oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon is. So we go from from the carbonyl carbon being a plus two oxidation state to a plus one oxidation state. We replaced one of the carbon oxygen bonds with a carbon carbon bond. So we reduced it right and that's that's our shorthand in biochem and in, in ochem, we can just look at, okay, the carbon's got, if carbon is bonded to something more electronegative, 
that's a plus one. If carbon's bonded to itself, that's zero. And if carbon's bonded to a hydrogen or something less electronegative, that's a negative one. And we just sum up all those bonds. Look at the bonds of the carbon itself and just sum those up to get the oxidation state. So here, our carbonyl carbon has a, an oxidation state of plus three. It's not fully oxidized, but it's close, right? Because you've got one carbon-carbon bond that counts for zero, and then three carbon-oxygen bonds that, you, that are each plus one. And then at the end, we wind up with our carbonyl carbon going all the way to a plus one. So we change the oxidation state twice in this bottom reaction. Right, and that's why we're we're adding one. That's why we need excess magnesium bromide because we're gonna have to do it twice. And each time it reacts, we're adding one methyl group at the expense of one carbon oxygen bond. All right, so our mechanism is gonna look very similar. It's just going to be in two steps this time. If we have a CH3, attach the magnesium. that methyl is going to come in here and attach. You're going to break the pi bond, which is going to make an intermediate that looks like we added our methyl group, we broke the pi bond. And so the reason this has to go in two steps is because that oxygen is never is not a good leaving group with it, when it has a negative charge on it. So it's not going to just leave. You break the carbon oxygen bond from the ester side and you wind up reforming that carbonyl group. So we go from an ester to a ketone. So we added the methyl group on. And there's the oxygen that was attached as the ester. So we break our, the first step is we break our ester up into, um, into a, what we call it a class, a class two carbonyl, um, the ketone. And then we have the, deprotonated alcohol as well. So we basically just split our ester up. And then we just, we have, because we have excess magnesium bromide, our second step looks just like our reaction up above. We wind up with the same step a second methyl group comes in and adds and you break the carbon pi bond again and this time it stays broken and we're left with two alkyl oxide ions that just need to be protonated so again the second step is just going to protonate both of those oxygens and again like we noticed with ozonolysis these ring opening reactions are tricky. You may you need to make sure you're keeping track of the number of carbons you have at each point. But the the steps themselves are not any more difficult just because it's a ring opening reaction. You just have to be a little bit a little bit uh, more careful with your your carbon counting. Yeah.
All right, so questions on Grignard reactions right now. Good. Feel free to, if something comes comes to you, feel free to let me know. We'll go over it. These reactions, I'm, I'm only gonna do, we'll do B for right now. There's nothing inherently tricky about these except they're the exact same thing we just looked at, except instead of adding a methyl group or another R group, we're adding a hydride instead, but the mechanism looks the same. So if we have the borane, and it's for the same reason too. Hydrogen is more electronegative than boron, so the hydrogen actually has the negative charge. And the hydrogen takes the electrons with it and can attack the carbonyl carbon. I have to break the carbon oxygen pi bonds. But in this, so instead of adding a methyl group, we're just adding a hydrogen. And then second step is just a proton transfer. So our product would look like it's not going to react with the pi bond at the bottom because the pi bond at the bottom doesn't have a partial positive, right? The pi bond at the bottom, the alkene, has equal electronegativity on both sides of the pi bond. So you don't have a partial positive for your hydride to attack. You don't have to draw the hydrogen on the hydride on that we added. But you can for the sake of keeping track of everything. All we did is add these two hydrogens first as a hydride, then as a proton transfer. All right? You guys see how it's really the same mechanism, just with a different different nucleophile. Uh, and in theory. The nucleophiles that we're using here actually work with, with alkyl halides as well. We're showing them working um, to attack the carbons on um, carbonyls, but in theory, you know, um, a, if you have a good leaving group, you can wind up with an SN2 reaction happening where hydride is your, is your nucleophile and just replacing a alkyl halide with a hydride. All right, so our other reactions for these nucleophiles are still valid. We use, predominantly use these nucleophiles when we're talking about carbonyls, though. And just for the sake of showing the answer here. If we just have a ketone, we're just returning it into an alcohol for these reduction steps. Um, here's some more practice here. We're gonna, I'm gonna leave these for now. If we have time, we'll come back to them later. Um, because there are some new reactions we need to add that again are not that new. We just they're just going to change things up, uh, up a little bit. Um, for instance, if we want to do a Grignard reaction and we want to make a Grignard reagent of something that also has an alcohol on it or has an oxygen on it in some capacity, um, we need to make sure that that oxygen doesn't react. And so to do that, we use what's called a protecting group. Um, and so that it basically just adds an extra step before and after the Grignard reagent. Any, any oxygen that you don't want to react when you expose it to magnesium needs to be protected. Um, and so that's what this, this, um, this TMS chloride is a solvent in triethylamine. Um, I take it back, triethylamine is the solvent, TMS is the protecting group. It basically 
you just wind up replacing the hydrogen with this TMS group, which um, is likely tetramethylsilane. Um, and you wind up with something that is stable enough that it won't react, but it's something that later we can remove that TMS from it. So this allows us to say, okay, well, this oxygen is still there, but it's not going to react with anything at this point. And so then you can do your Grignard reaction and have it attack something else and add our groups to it and convert the, the um, bromide to a oxygen, more or less, by the time we've gone through these steps. Um, and then we remove the protecting group with this TBAF reagent. Right, so this is not something that is something I want you to see and be aware of what a protecting group is. Um, but until next quarter, when we get into a lot of synthesis, um, we're not going to need to worry about this too much. I just want you to be aware of the idea of a protecting group. Um, and we see this in, in um, biochemical synthesis too, in cells, there are some intermediates that exist mostly as a way of protecting a part of the molecule while something else is going to happen to make sure a certain reactive group stays as that reactive group when it when all said and done <clears throat> that's um our alcohols can also still go through substitution reactions. So our substitution reactions are very similar to the substitution reactions we had where oxygen was a nucleophile and we had an, an, a halide as our leaving group. It's just a substitution reaction that goes backward from the way we'd normally think about it, right? So normally we would think about if we have hydroxide as a nucleophile and bromide as a leaving group, the bromide leaves and hydroxide can come in and attach. If we play around with Le Chatelier's principle, though, we can actually wind up with the, you know, favoring the opposite product. If we start from something that has an OH group, if we put enough of a strong acid around, we can actually turn that into that oxygen into a good leaving group and have a weaker nucleophile wind up coming in and displacing the oxygen. Basically, by, by manipulating the concentrations of the reactants, we can favor making something where we have the weaker nucleophile attached. And part of this is that we have to turn the OH into a better nucleophile. If it's a tertiary alcohol, um, it's going to go through an SN1 reaction, which means we need the oxygen to leave before our new nucleophile can come in, right? So the first step with these if with a tertiary alcohol, is that we need to turn we need to turn our alcohol into a better leaving group. And the easiest way to do that is to protonate it. If you expose it to a strong acid, you're going to protonate that oxygen. And turning an OH group into an H2O group means it's going to be really easy to get that, not really easy, but it's, it winds up being an equilibrium reaction where we can get that water molecule to leave and be left with H2O and a tertiary carbocation. And now whatever else was around, whatever's the other part of our strong acid can come in and act as a nucleophile. So yeah, if we use hydrobromic acid, we wind up with bromine coming in. If, we, if we're using hydroiodic acid, iodide comes in. If we're using hydrochloric acid, chloride comes in. And so the net result is just that we replaced our OH group with a halide. And we can do the same thing with tertiary or primary alcohols 
but because it's not going to go through an SN1 reaction, it's a little bit trickier. We need to we need to have other reagents around. It's not just enough usually to have a strong acid. So if it's if you use hydrobromic acid, that's a strong enough acid that you can get it to go, but you're not going to have great yields. <clears throat> Um, this is going to be an equilibrium reaction, and so you're going to be left with, um, you're going to be left with some some of your alcohol remaining because you're not going to get 100% yield. Um, so there are a couple of other reactants that we can do that are going to essentially um, make the alcohol a even better leaving group than just water. Um, and that's what these bottom two reactions are. And that's what both of the reactions are going to do over here. So we've, we've seen tosyl chloride. Um, you guys might not remember it, but that was one way that we said we, um, that, that we referred to making alcohols better leaving groups was to con convert them from an alcohol to a tosylate. Um, and those uh, tosylates, um, are going to, and that's what this first step is. You basically just replacing the hydrogen with a TS group, with a tosylate group, which just makes it a much better leaving group. And then if you have bromide around as a nucleophile, it can come in and displace it. And you get the SN2 reaction happening. And you see that umbrella flip that back from last quarter. And we'll look we'll look at these mechanisms too in a second, the ones that, that are are most relevant. Um, and phosphorus tribromide is going to basically do the same thing. You wind up with the phosphorus attaching and making covalent bond to the oxygen and losing a bromide. And then you have a bromide that can act as a nucleophile, and the phosphorus leaves and takes the oxygen with it. So let's look at those before we take our break for today. Um, so this is the SOCl2. So this was the top reaction on the right-hand side. So we're going to look at that one for starters. And then we'll look at the bromination. So essentially, the way we make it into a better leaving group, that's, that's what this whole process does, is you take an OH, which is a bad leaving group, and you wind up making a covalent bond between the oxygen and the sulfur. Sulfur is a relatively electron rich and not very electronegative, so you're making a more stable bond by doing that. And we actually do wind up with the pyridine with the solvent actually is gonna play a little bit of a role because it can act as a base in this case. And so we just need something around that can act as a base to, base to basically um, pull the hydrogen off of the alcohol. Once you make that stable oxygen sulfur bond, we just need something that can take that, that hydrogen atom or ion rather. And we can converted it to a much better leaving group by doing this process, right? So we wind up with nucleophilic attack. We wind up breaking a pi bond and leaving group leaves and you reform the pi bond. So step one, nucleophilic attack. Step two, leaving group leaves. Step three, proton transfer. And then we have another nucleophilic attack. All right, so this is a complicated looking mechanism, but it's, I mean, it's not, even 
even as bad as um, our hydroboration oxidation, right? Our hydroboration, that was a much longer mechanism than this. What this, and, and the net result of this is it allows us to do it through an SN2 mechanism where your OH is the leaving group and we replace it with a chloride. And we'll see that if the, the analogous reaction is with PBr3, phosphorus tribromide, um, except it's e even faster because it doesn't have a proton transfer step in the middle. You wind up with a nucleophilic attack of the, of the oxygen, attacks the phosphorus, and a bromine leaves. So basically, you have two SN2 reactions happening in a row. You have SN2 reaction where, you're, where your oxygen displaces a bromide on the phosphorus. And then part two, revenge of the bromide, the bromide comes in and displaces the oxygen. So they effectively just switch places. All right. Let's, I'm going to have you guys give this a try. Try drawing out mechanisms for these three reactions here. Um, and then we'll take our break on top of that as well. So let's say we're going to come back at nine o'clock and we'll go through these. All right, break first or work on mechanism first, up to you. Um, but uh, I will start working through these in. 18 minutes.
All right, guys, I'm going to start working through these mechanisms. So for the first one, we had, it was the same mechanism we went over first with SOCl2. So once again, that's going to look like plus the alcohol. And let's see. clear. So we're starting with the wedge. Yeah. So we're going to start by making nucleophilic attack. on the sulfur and chloride leaves. And actually that's usually drawn as two steps. So first, first step is, it's gonna look like that. And then we're going to wind up with the We just have the R group drawn like that. So we have a negative charge there, positive charge on the oxygen with three bonds. Reform that carbonyl-ish bond, the sulfur to oxygen pi bond, and one of your chlorides leaves. So remember this, the net, the overall process for this mechanism was nucleophilic attack, leaving group leaves, proton transfer, nucleophilic attack. So first step over here, that's our first nucleophilic attack. Our second step here is leaving group leaves. And what we still have after that is we have our We still have one of our oxygens on, attached to the sulfur has a free bond, so it's got a positive charge. So that's where the pyridine comes in. Pyridine is that benzene ring. With one of the carbons replaced with a nitrogen. And it's just gonna act as a base for that proton transfer step. So step one, nucleophilic attack. Step two, leaving group leaves. Step three, proton transfer. And then step four is nucleophilic attack again. And it's really nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaves at the same time. So I'm going to redraw the whole molecule. Let's see, it was 
And then we still have the rest of the molecule attached to the sulfur. But this compound we just made is all of a sudden a good leaving group. So our chloride can come in here. We have our second nucleophilic attack, leaving group leaves. And because it's all happening in one step, because it's SN2, we wind up with that umbrella flip. We went, the chloride has to attack from the back of the molecule. So we wind up making the inverted stereochemistry. Right, the net result is just an SN2 reaction. It's just a more complicated version of an SN2 reaction because we have to make a good leaving group first. And same for B. For B, it's very similar, except we're going to do it just in two steps. Nucleophilic attack of the oxygen on the phosphate, on the phosphorus to do push off a bromide, and then the bromide comes in and does a nucleophilic attack on the carbon. All right, so same starting compound. So our mechanism is just going to look like Our phosphorus tribromide. Is attacked by the OH group and a bromide leaves. So there's our first SN2 step. So we make an intermediate that looks like oxygen covalently bound to PBR2. And then we wind up with the bromide that what just left turns around it and attacks the carbon. So that's our classic SN2 step, right? So this first step is turning this phosphorus attached to the oxygen into a really good leaving group. The second step is leaving group leaves and your bromide comes in and attaches. Right, so in both cases, the net result is that we wind up replacing Wind up with the stereochemistry being inverted. We replace the OH group with a halogen. Right, C, we went over this mechanism the other day. It's and we, we did it once earlier as well when we did the ring opening, Esther. It's just going to be your nucleophilic attack by a hydride twice. All right, so your first intermediate would look like well, first you're going to break the pi bond and have a new hydride attached to the carbonyl carbon. 
then you wind up making your carbonyl group again and your alkoxy group winds up leaving and then we end up with the hydride attacks the carbonyl one more time does it again so we have two reduction steps in a row All right, so I've bare bones mechanism, the second one. Not it's not the comprehensive every step because we've gone over this one a little bit already. The trickiest step is that leaving group leaves and you remake the carbonyl. And then it's the same as as any aldehyde being attacked attacked by lithium aluminum hydride. Um, this is just a reminder that if we can go through SN1 and SN2 reactions, we can go also go through E1 and E2 reactions, right? So just like we can, we can have an OH group leave and be replaced by bromide or chloride, we can also have an OH group leave and form an, an alkene. And in the same exact way, that we just saw, we can have, uh, we can turn the OH group into a good leaving group. And then if we just expose it to a strong base, we get the elimination product, or we can protonate it with concentrated acid and expose it to heat and get a similar result. Depending on what the rest of the molecule looks like, we might not want to do this first one if it's gonna break up, if the acid is gonna react with another one of our functional groups. If there's another functional group we want to, to preserve, then adding concentrated sulfuric acid and heat might not be the best way to get the rest of the molecule to stay the way it is. So if you have just one OH group that you want to leave to give you an elimination reaction, it's usually a better idea to use the slightly more complicated mechanism, but the one that's gonna have fewer side effects. Um, otherwise, it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit like early early medicine in the Wild West, where they would just straight up prescribe you hard drugs as a way to you know just brute force over the symptoms. Oh, you're depressed? Here, have some cocaine. Um, like yes, that works to counter depression to some extent, but there are a lot of unwanted side effects, right? Um, so it's a little bit trickier to do. The mechanism is more complicated, but there are fewer side effects if we use, say, an antidepressant instead, which is what is the, the equivalent in our analogy is this second, second line here. Um, here are a couple different versions of oxidations. So we've, we've covered reductions of ketones to make an alcohol. We can do the reverse as well. We can oxidize an alcohol to make a ketone or a carboxylic acid. Um, but these mechanisms are much more complicated and less well understood. And so we're not gonna go through the mechanisms for these. Um, but essentially, anytime you see a dichromate, um, anything where you've got a metal with a really high oxidation state, it's gonna try to reduce itself and become more stable, usually at the expense of an alcohol. So if you have a secondary alcohol and you expose it to dichromate, you get a ketone. So this is not a strong enough oxidizing agent to, um, to break a carbon-carbon bond. So you're basically going to be limited as to what your product is based on how many hydrogens does your carbon have to lose. So if you've got a secondary alcohol, you've got one hydrogen for your secondary alcohol to lose. And so it turns the secondary alcohol into a ketone. 
if it's a primary alcohol, there are two hydrogens that your carbon can lose. And so you wind up with both of those being removed and replaced with a carbon oxygen bond. So you, a primary alcohol goes all the way to a carboxylic acid. If we wanted to stop a primary alcohol at the aldehyde, we need to be very careful with what with how strong our oxidizing agent can be. And so we have two options. We have this PCC in dichloromethane or DMP in dichloromethane. Um, and the mo the more common one generally is this is PCC in dichloromethane and PCC I don't have the figure in here um I believe is yeah there it is it is a chromate Pyridinium chlorochromate. So you wind up with a with chlorochromate instead of dichromate. The reason being here that this is less of a is is already partially reduced from the dichromate stage. So this is a little bit less reactive, and so it won't fully oxidize a primary alcohol all the way to the carboxylic acid. Um, so any of these three reaction conditions will wind up, they will oxidize the primary alcohol, but they stop at the aldehyde. So the way that I would classify these in my head is that all of these oxidizing agents, they're all sodium dichromate, except for these other ones down here. So if you can remember, sodium dichromate are my really strong oxidizing agents. And then if you see anything else, that doesn't look like that, that's not one of our, it's not a reduction agent, then say, okay, well, that must be one of my weak oxidizing agents, right? I, I would, since these are fairly complicated reaction conditions here, and they only really show up in one case, the way I would organize this mentally is that goes in my everything else category. Remember the ones that are simpler reaction conditions, like the hydrides, like your Grignard reagents, like dichromates. If you have those all categorized, if you see anything else, that, oh, that must that must also be from my everything else category. And just know that that's your mild oxidizing agents. And then lastly, if you expose phenol to a to a strong oxidizing agent it actually will oxidize um, and you don't, it's not strictly speaking, breaking the benzene ring. It looks like it is, which it should raise a red flag, right? Um, it doesn't look like we have a benzene ring, but if you look at the resonance structures, we do still have a benzene ring because the resonance structure here would look like if we think about one of these oxygens keeping a pair of electrons, you could draw a resonance structure that looks like a benzene ring with an oxygen with a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. So because we have all this other resonance, we still have a bunch of pi bonds that are still all conjugated together. Benzoquinone is still an aromatic compound, so it is relatively stable. Um, and that's that's what you get when you oxidize phenol, is you wind up with it rearranging into this benzoquinone form that is aromatic, even though it doesn't look like it at first glance. And the nice thing about that one is it's basically always going to be the exact same reaction. I can't even mix this up very much. Um, because other phenols won't react exactly the same way. It's just basically true straight up phenol will react this way. So I can't even mix up and put different R groups or anything on here, really. It's always going to be this exact same reaction.
All right. That's actually the entire chapter on alcohols. So we had reduction of ketones and acid derivatives and aldehydes to make OH groups. We have the oxidation of OH groups to make aldehydes and ketones. And then we had those substitution in the elimination reactions, which aren't really new. We just have to have those extra steps to make the OH a better leaving group. Right, those are our three categories of reactions um, for, for alcohols. Um, and we will also see that ethers behave a lot like alcohols in a lot of ways. Um, they have some different, some different properties, um, and they do wind up showing up also in a lot of biological compounds and a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, and our nomenclature for these is even easier than with the alcohols. We're going to name them just as prefixes, the same way we would, we would name, um, you know, if you've got a chlorine attached, you would just add chloro as a prefix. We're going to name them with prefixes just like they're a branch. We just have a slightly different prefix. Um, so melatonin, good example. Melatonin looks a lot like tryptophan as well, right? Um, Melatonin and serotonin are both relatively closely relinked in terms of, of overall molecular shape, which is one of the reasons why getting enough sleep is related to depression. If you don't get enough sleep, you're more likely to be depressed. And that's because your melatonin levels get all funky, which messes with your serotonin levels, which messes with your mood. Um, and this is also you know, the, these, this is one of the reasons why um, a lot of, of antidepressants will also mess with your sleep schedule because of the amount of, of that melatonin and serotonin are linked. Um, and we do also see it's a more complicated looking ether, but in morphine, we also have an ether link. Anytime you've got two carbons, that are linked together by an oxygen. That's an ether. All right, so you can refer to it as an, as an oxygen bridging two different R groups, linking two different R groups together uh, is usually the best way to think about these, these ethers. Um, and they're not going to have, to, it's an oxygen where both of the bonds in the stable form are to a carbon. It can be the same ring structure or it can be two different carbon groups. Um, and there, there's two different naming conventions. The, the old school name is to just name both of the sides as though it was a branch, as, as though they were branches and just add the word ether at the end. So, if you have an ether where one side of it is an ethyl group and the other side is a methyl group, you would name that ethyl methyl ether. Um, if they're both ethyl groups, it would be diethyl ether. That's the ether that they used as anesthetic in the Civil War uh, and early 1900s. Um, dimethyl ether is less common because it's got a low enough boiling point that it's not very, it winds up evaporating too quickly, but it has similar effects to diethyl ether. Um, and they would want, they would traditionally, you would use T butyl as one side. So you could have an isopropyl ether. Is, diisopropyl ether would look like oxygen isopropyl group. Ooh. isopropyl group. That'd be diisopropyl ether. Makes sense. It's a little bit trickier because what if you have things that are more complicated than you could just name as a branch? Um, we wind up not using this system very often anymore. For the smaller ethers, you do still see it. Diethyl ether is still the common way to refer to diethyl ether. Although the systematic name is a little bit simpler is you just name, name it as a branch. You find your longest continuous carbon chain and name that as your parent molecule 
and then you name the ether, the entire ether group, the oxygen and the branch attached to the other side of it as an alk oxy branch. So instead of a, being a methyl group, it's a methoxy group. So as in a methyl with an oxygen, right? So this would be, if we're using the old school naming system, this would be ethyl pentyl ether, or it's ethoxy pentane. Um, so here's some practice. And again, you could name these in using either of those systems. This first one in the common system or the old school naming convention would be methylphenol ether. O-M-N-O-P, yeah, methylphenol ether. Um, but it, or you could name it methoxybenzene. So that group is a methoxy group. And the longest continuous carbon chain is benzene. I believe this even has a common name. I think that might be anisole, might be the common name for that molecule. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, but methoxybenzene would be the systematic name for it. And examples like B really make it clear why we'd want to use the systematic name rather than the common name, right? Because naming each of these as branches would be a real, a real headache. So if we start by just naming the parent molecule, and then we have two, we have, well, three branches attached to the parent molecule, a little bit simpler to see what's happening here. So our parent molecule would be cyclopentane. We've got two chlorines attached and our numbering could go either way on this one. Um, probably wanna keep the alkoxy group as low as possible, but it doesn't really make a difference. So if we say that it's gonna be one ethoxy, ethoxy because there are two carbons attached to the oxygen. So eth for two, oxy for the oxygen attached. So when one ethoxy, three, three, dichloro, cyclopentane. And then we would want to um, establish R versus S. But that's nothing, nothing new to us. If we're going to assign priority, there's our asymmetric center. One, two, three hydrogen is already facing the back. So clockwise. So R. R1 ethoxy 3 3 dichlorocyclopentane. That one would be a real headache to name with the common, with the, the old school names, right? So the systematic names, once again, once you learn the rules, same rules every time, we're just adding the fact that we can add oxy as a prefix, as a suffix to a prefix, I guess. Um, we can add oxy as a branch, alkoxy branches. Um, there's some, just a, I wouldn't uh, necessarily call this current events, but uh, in the last in the last forty years or so, um, there's been some a lot of work being done with what are called um, crown ethers both in terms of inorganic chemistry and in terms of uh, drug delivery. Um, crown ethers 
Um, they call them that because they look kind of like a crown. And when you look at them in 3D, um, and the, the result of these is you wind up with these, these systems where you have a whole bunch of oxygens all pointing towards the middle of the molecule. So you wind up with a lot of um, partial negative charges in the middle of the molecule. And so that means it, it can actually form a really, really strong bond, ionic bonds with, and technically they're ion dipole interactions, but you have so many of them that you wind up with them forming really, really strong complexes with metal ions. And so they start using these kind of compounds to treat heavy metal poisoning. Um, because you can wind if you if you expose these to a metal ion, that metal ion is basically going to sit right in the middle of that and be attacked, attached by all the different oxygens around it, the way that iron sits in the middle of a hemoglobin ring. Um, and let's see if I can get a. a good view from the side. Uh, I, I think you guys can visualize that it would look somewhat like a crown. Um, we're not gonna name too much, name them too often. So there's our, our crown ether and that area right in the middle is where we would see where a metal ion would sit. And you can see that that's going to look very similar to a heme group. Heme, heme on a, um, in hemoglobin, the heme group is this ring structure that has this empty spot in the middle where you've got a lot of partial negative charges pointed right in the middle and that's where the iron atom sits or iron ion rather, is bound to the heme group by sitting right in the middle. So the crown ethers are, are a way we have of um, mimicking that. They call that biomimicry, where we're trying to use um, biology as a starting point and then use chemical synthesis to sort of mimic some of that. Um, so they use this for drug delivery systems. I think that you see these sometimes in... Um, in chemotherapy to try and make it a more directed um, dosage. They basically surround these toxic chemicals with, with crown ethers that can kind of keep all of that, those toxic heavy metals contained until they get where they're supposed to be. And then they release um, in a way that kind of mimics hemoglobin letting go of oxygen when it gets to the right part of the body. Um, I believe cisplatin is a, No, cisplatin is simpler than that. Cisplatin is a common chemotherapy drug that's really nasty. Um, and so they, it's platinum ions, which are toxic heavy metals. Um, and so one of the ways of trying to, to limit how toxic that is to the surrounding areas would be to dose this with a crown ether instead of just dosing it like this. Um, also gives you more of a time delay if you do it that way. So that's that's all what's referred to as drug delivery chemistry. It's not necessarily that the drugs themselves are different, but they're administered in a different way that produces different effects. <clears throat> um, we can also use these and to to basically allow us to use fluorine more often. Um, because if we have, for instance, if we had potassium fluoride and we were trying to do this in an aprotic solvent to make fluoride a better nucleophile in an aprotic solvent, well, potassium fluoride is not going to dissolve in benzene. Most of our aprotic solvents are too nonpolar for any of our fluorides to dissolve. So that's one of the reasons why we can't use fluorides very often. And crown ethers help with that because basically they form such a good bond with the potassium ion part of potassium fluoride that the fluoride could then go free. And then 
because fluorides are better nucleophiles than bromides, we could then go through a, an SN2 reaction where your fluoride just displaces the bromine. Um, and this is not something we're gonna spend a lot of time on, but this is just sort of a, I want you to know what crown ethers are and what makes them special is that is that all that electron density pointed towards the middle that makes those really stable bonds with pretty much any metal ion. And if you change the size of that ring structure, the size of the crown, you can change what size um, metal ions you're gonna bond with. If you want it to preferentially bond with heavy metals that are really large, then you use a larger crown ether. If you want it to bond preferentially with smaller metal ions, you use a smaller crown ether. Right, so it gives us a lot of control over what ions are actually going to participate in this. Um, and I, this is the sort of thing that that um, is not referred. So nanotechnology is still a size larger than this. is still a, a whole scale larger, but it's sort of similar in that we can control at the molecular level what's happening by changing what the size of the molecules are. It's not like we can actually get in there with tweezers and pull out specific ions. But if we're careful with our synthesis and how we separate out these crown ethers, we, it has the same net effect, basically, of being able to preferentially pull copper ions versus platinum ions. So why the engineers can't get rid of the chemists quite yet. Engineers are pretty good at making stuff really small, but they're not quite at the atomic level yet. Um, a couple of adaptations of our alcohol reactions as they apply to ethers. Um, they will also go through a dehydration reaction. Um, if you wind, you can wind up essentially with a, if you make a good leaving group the same way we did with our bromides and our chlorides, but then expose it to an alcohol instead of a bromide, you still go through a, an SN2 reaction, just like before, except that we wind up making an ether instead of, um, instead of making a bromide. Um, the problem is this is somewhat limited in terms of synthesis. This is basically, all you have to do to make diethyl ether is you take pure ethanol and expose it to an acid. Because a strong acid will protonate the OH group and then you can have your another ethanol molecule can come in and, and displace the OH group. Um, this doesn't work that well. This has got two different equilibrium steps in it. It's not gonna give you great yields, which is why you don't have diethyl ether spontaneously being made when you have Everclear, right? If you have Everclear, you can't just add lemon juice to Everclear to get diethyl ether. Um, but that's what this reaction is showing, essentially. Um, but it's not going to give you great yields. And in terms of synthesis, it's only going to make symmetrical ether. Symmetrical ether is exactly what it sounds like. It means it's an ether where you have the same thing on each side. If we want to make an asymmetrical ether, we have to do this in a more controlled fashion. Sean, I have a quick question. Yeah. Are we still messing with like the concentration of acid? Like, is this dilute or is that the Le Chatelier's principle part or, or is that um, not going on here? So you, you might notice that we are the, the acid is actually a catalyst, so I don't think we don't need much acid to do this. Um, but you might need to do something like like heat it so that your diethyl ether boils off, and you could get you use Le Chatelier's principle that way by either starting with really high concentration of ethanol or by removing the the ether once you've made it. Um, but I but because you are, are, because the acid is the actual catalyst, increasing the concentration of the acid will not affect your equilibrium, right? Because, because the acid won't actually show up in your equilibrium expression. It's just needed to start the whole thing. Gotcha. Yeah, and it doesn't, 
Yeah, I think I see that now. It doesn't include water either. So cool. Thank you. So water is it's not shown here, but we did have water as a leaving group. So if you had some way of removing oh, okay. water as it yeah, was that's being made. Okay. Yeah. That that would definitely work because and that's all dehydrations are going to have that that aspect. The problem is water is kind of difficult to remove as it's being made because it's got a high boiling point right so probably what we would do is add acid to pure ethanol um and then heat it so that we're boiling off the ether and distill the ether as we're doing this and then leave the water all behind it but you're still going to be limited to how much product you can make because you can't really remove both of those products the, the diethyl ether boils at like room temperature ish and then ethanol, which is our reactant, boils before the water does. So you can't remove, you can't just heat it to remove the water because then you're going to remove reactant as well. Um, so this is something that happens. It's the first wave they found of making ether, but it was not very efficient and it wasn't very useful because you could only make symmetrical ethers. And so what we use instead is what's known as the Williamson ether synthesis. And this is a way we have of controlling this. We use one alcohol and one alkyl halide. And by changing the alcohol versus the alkyl halide, the blue R and the red R don't have to be symmetrical. We can control um, this process a lot more than we could control the, the one before. And so the Williamson ether synthesis we start with the sodium hydride and essentially what the sodium hydride does is it's just going to deprotonate that alcohol um so the net result here is we just we turn this into a really good nucleophile instead and then when we expose it to something with a good leaving group, we just have an SN2 happen. So we just make the Williamson ether synthesis. It gets, it's a named reaction because it, it has a lot of historical value. This is one of the first, you know, true synthesis, really well-controlled synthesis processes that were used. Um, but you, it's really not that complicated. It's just deprotonate your alcohol and then use your alcohol as a nucleophile. Hey, this is still just SN2. We just, the key step is making your nucleophile strong in a controlled way. Right, so depending on what you start with and what your R, your red R is, what your alkyl halide is, that's going to allow you to control what ether you make. And so the, this one, we are not limited to only making symmetrical ethers. We are limited by sterics. We can't do this with a tertiary um, R group or a tertiary leaving group on our red molecule. So if we want this to happen to make a tertiary ether, we would need to switch the two R groups probably. But let's look at how we could do that. So if we started with T butyl alcohol, and we deprotonated it and exposed it to methyl iodide, we could get a tertiary ether on one side and a methyl on the other side. And this is MTBE, which is a gasoline additive. Um, and the MTBE stands for methyl hurt butyl ether. So this is named the old school way. The way we would name it would be something like 2-methyl-2-methoxypropane. But we can't flip those two steps. We can't start from methanol and use T-butyl iodide because we need that second step has to be is an SN2, right? So we can't have a tertiary carbon with our leaving group in the second step. So we couldn't we couldn't make di-T-butyl ether using this process. We need one of them, one of the two sides of our ether has to be either primary or secondary. 
Does that make sense? So which two, how would you write the two possible reactions or there are two possible reactions we could use here. Yeah, you could use both, both possibilities. Write out the two possible ways you could make ethoxybenzene. Give you two or three minutes and I'll work through this and then we'll be done. So if we start by just breaking up our ether onto the two sides, we've got a benzene ring on one side and an ethyl group on the other side. So we could start from ethanol expose it to sodium hydride and then expose that to bromobenzene, except does benzene go through SN2 reactions? Too much, too much electron density. You can't have a, an electrophile get in there and attack a carbon on a benzene ring. So on paper, this be one way we would write it, but then this realistically wouldn't work. because benzenes don't go through SN2. But if we switch that around, if we said, okay, well, instead let's make the benzene side, the alcohol to start. If we started with phenol, If we start from phenol and we say, okay, we'll expose it to NaH, we can deprotonate the phenol that way and turn the phenol into, into a phenolate, into a nucleophile. And then step two then would be expose it to ethyl bromide or bromoethane instead. So the net result is we're going to deprotonate, deprotonate the oxygen in step one, and the oxygen acts as the nucleophile. This way would work. The other way wouldn't work. Anytime we've got a benzene ring, we have to be careful with this because we can't just split it up in both sides and have either side work equally well. <laughs> 
if it was a cyclohexane instead of a benzene, then we could do that because cyclohexane behaves like any other alkyl bromide. Right, so we're piling on a lot of named reactions in Grignard, Williamson ether synthesis, um, but they're still following our rules of nucleophilic attack. They're still following all of our same reaction patterns as before. So it's just more to keep track of, but the steps aren't different. It's just like nomenclature. We laid the groundwork last quarter, for all these reactions. And now we're just expanding and applying the same rules to more systems. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions before we, we end it for today or for now? Casey? Yeah, I was going to ask um, with the last slide, how would you convert a methanol over to the um, ether. Sorry, say, say that last bit again. Uh, how would you start from uh, methanol to the um, empty? So where did my slides go? There they are. So if we wanted to, to start from methanol, so the first step for all of these is you take the alcohol that you're starting with and you deprotonate the alcohol. The sodium hydride, that's what it does, is it, it's going to just deprotonate the alcohol. So that would the first step would turn the T-butyl alcohol into T-butoxide. It would turn a methanol into methoxide ion. But these are still, so the, the first step is the same for all of these. The alcohol that you start with gets deprotonated. The reason that the bottom reaction doesn't work isn't because you don't make, because you don't have a good nucleophile, it's because that T-butyl group, a tertiary carbon can't go through SN2 because there's just too much stuff around the active carbon. So we would use the top one because then if we had the methyl, We could wind up with the iodide leaving and the oxygen ion attacking the carbon that had the iodide attached to it. Right. So when it comes to the to the practical side, we just need to remember, OK, my second step can't be a tertiary alkyl halide because we, the second step is SN2. It has to not have too much in the way of sterics in the way. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll go ahead and stop recording.